تفضل اخي تفضل اخي ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى اله وسلم تسليما كثيرا اما بعد <تصفيق> The best of speech is the speech of Allah Azza wa Jal. And the best of guidance is the guidance of our Messenger Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the worst of all affairs are those affairs that have newly been added into the religion. Every newly added affair in the religion is an innovation and every innovation is a misguidance. And every misguidance is in the fire of hell. We ask Allah to protect us from innovation, misguidance and the fire of hell. Ayyakum Allah jami'an, ikhwani wa akhawati fi Allah. We ask Allah, tabarak wa ta'ala, to make this uh, gathering of ours, a gathering of mercy, a gathering of blessings, a gathering that pleases Allah, tabarak wa ta'ala, and causes His mercy and reward to be bestowed upon those who participate in it. We ask Allah Azza wa Jal to reward greatly those who have organized, those who have participated. The uh, the topic of this series, bi'idnillahi ta'ala, as uh, many of you have seen, uh, is related to Ramadan. And uh, the focus is going to be more on certain aspects that may be considered mannerisms. Aspects related to intentions or if you wish objectives and the purpose of ramadan versus discussing ramadan in terms of its rulings and the jurisprudence that needs to be taught and learned to observe a correct fast i believe that some of you may have already seen the classes that are being offered um, <coughs> to cover that aspect we ask Allah to make those beneficial and blessed. So tonight or today, I should say, inshallah, we will talk about how to receive the month of Ramadan. And before we begin, I want to discuss with you a concept that the people of knowledge have frequently mentioned, and that is the concept that Ramadan is a guest. Perhaps some of you have already heard or read somewhere the scholars of Islam describing Ramadan as a guest. And this is a very useful analogy. And the reason this analogy is being used is in order to help us understand all the more how much readiness we should have for the arrival of Ramadan. Because you see, Ramadan is very similar to a guest. And as such, what is required of you is very similar to what is required of you when you're about to receive an honored guest. Ramadan is like a guest in the sense that it's only there for a short amount of time and then it departs. Just like a guest, they come, they stay with you for a little bit and then they leave. Ramadan is like a guest in the sense that it is honored. Ramadan is very noble. And likewise, when you receive guests, they are honored. They are held in very high regard. Ramadan is like a guest in the sense that there are certain duties that you owe to Allah Taala when Ramadan arrives. Just like when you receive a guest, you owe to Allah Azza wa Jal to honor your guest. We all know the hadith in Bukhari and Muslim where the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Man kana yu'minu billahi wal yawmil akhiri yukrim dayfa. Whoever believes in Allah on the final day, then let him honor his guests and let him here is an indication of the obligation it is not for uh, indicating that something is optional but rather that something is obligatory ramadan is like a guest in the sense that it comes bringing with it joy 
glad tidings and happiness. Just like when you receive a guest and you're happy that they've arrived and you rejoice at their arrival and you meet them with happiness, with joy, with smiles. Likewise, Ramadan is a season to rejoice and to praise Allah Taala for having granted you life long enough to witness yet another Ramadan. And just like a guest, and this is the last point I want to make, about this particular comparison, Ramadan comes bearing gifts. And how many are those guests that don't come in empty handed? They come in laden with gifts. They gift you, they gift your family, sometimes they gift your children. Ramadan comes bearing gifts. Gifts of the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His forgiveness. And if we understand this, we understand why the scholars draw this analogy liken Ramadan to a guest because when you understand this it motivates you it gives you the drive to prepare for this honored guest just as you would prepare physically for a guest that is about to visit you at your place at your home so what are some of these preparations that we can <clears throat> engage in in order to ready ourselves for the arrival of Ramadan. Faza mentioned a number of things. And that which I want to share with you is something that uh, Sheikh Abdul Aziz Ibn Baz Ta'ala mentioned. He mentioned that Ramadan should be received with joy and happiness. Ramadan should be received with Showing gratitude to Allah Taala that He has allowed you to live long enough to see Ramadan. Let's pause here for a second because you see, having reached Ramadan is a gift so tremendous that it truly deserves for us to stop with it and ponder the magnificence of Allah's benevolence towards us that we have seen yet another Ramadan. How many of our brothers and sisters were denied this? They didn't live to see another Ramadan. The Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he had two companions that Pretty much accepted Islam in the same time frame. And then one of them died in a battle. Allah Azza granted him martyrdom. The other one, he lived for an additional year and then he passed away. Another man from the companions, he saw both of them in a dream. But he saw the one who lived later, or longer, I should say. Enter a Jannah first. So when he woke up, he told this dream to Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and he was surprised. Why would the one who died a martyr in jihad in fighting in the cause of Allah enter Jannah last, while the one who died a normal death enter Jannah first? The Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam explained that this is not a reason to be surprised. Or isn't it a fact that he has prayed this many and this many prayers, meaning the prayers of an entire year? Isn't it a fact that he has fasted the month of Ramadan? To the end of the hadith of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We take from this uh, snippet or this portion of the hadith how the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam highlighted the effect of having attended yet another Ramadan and how that additional Ramadan has raised one of these two companions above his friend who had accepted Islam in the same time frame although his companion had died a martyr this alone is sufficient proof of how great the effect of witnessing Ramadan is on your ranks 
in the hereafter on the amount of reward that Allah shall grant when you meet him ta'ala, having fulfilled the duty of Allah that he obligated upon you in the month of Ramadan. <clears throat> also, from the things that is part of preparing for Ramadan is to share the glad tidings that Ramadan is coming or that Ramadan has come. We know this from the Sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that he used to give this good news. In one hadith narrated by Abu Huray radiallahu anhu, the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when Ramadan arrived, he said, قَدْ جَاءَكُمْ رَمَضَانْ شَهْرٌ مُبَارَكُ Ramadan has come to you, a blessed month. Blessed, meaning that the good in it is unusually abundant. This is a very simple explanation of what blessings are. And the opposite of that is when something doesn't have the usual amount of good in it. And this is called mamhuqul baraka. There's no baraka in it. That's the opposite of mubarak. So, for example, you can say malun mubarak, blessed wealth, money that is unusually beneficial. You spend from it, it doesn't want to finish. It allowed you to cover multiple things that needed to be covered. And the money sufficed, surprisingly so. It was abundant. The good in it was abundant. You can say, waladun mubarak, child that is mubarak. They're always gravitating towards that which is good. They're always gravitating towards that which is obedience to Allah. They're always kind to their parents and making dua for their parents and so on and so forth. So that child is mubarak. And all the prophets of Allah are mubarakun. Isa alayhi salatu wasalam said about himself, he said, وَجَعَلَنِي مُبَارَكًا أَيْنَمَا كُنْتْ Allah has made me blessed wherever I may be. And such is the affair of those who engage in the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They become blessed. As for Ramadan, it is a blessed time. قَدْ جَاءَكُمْ رَمَضَانْ شَهْرٌ مُبَارَكٌ A blessed month, specifically. Then he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, افترض الله عليكم صيامه Allah has made compulsory upon you its fasting. يفتح فيه أبواب الجنة The gates of Al-Jannah are opened in it. ويغلق فيه أبواب الجحيم And the gates of the hellfire are closed in it. وتغل فيه الشياطين And the devils are shackled in it. Well, there's a couple of points to, to be made here. Number one, the gates of Jannah are opened. What does this mean? As we know, Prophet ﷺ said, حُفَّةِ الْجَنَّةُ بِالْمَكَارِهِ Jannah is surrounded with makarih, things that are disliked, things that are difficult. When the gates of Jannah are opened, it means that these obstacles and these barriers are reduced. In other words, good deeds become more easy to engage in. The things that are disliked all of a sudden become less of a burden. This is the effect of Ramadan. The opposite is also true. And the gates of the hellfire are closed. Again, going back to the same hadith that we referenced, he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, The hellfire is surrounded by, is um, enclosed with things that are desired, lustful and desired things that are sinful. These are the obstacles between us and the hellfire. These are the things that are surrounding the hellfire. So people gravitate towards the things that they desire. And that's how they end up in the hellfire. Nobody's going to the hellfire because of its heat, because of its burning flames, because of the screams of its inhabitants. Rather, people are going towards the hellfire because of that fence around it, that alluring and deceptive fence imposed of desires, things that people want. Things that people crave. So when the gates of the hellfire are closed, this is a reference to, these, to the fact that these desirable things become less alluring, less plentiful, less available. That obstacles are placed between us and those things by the permission of Allah, tabarak wa ta'ala, by his blessing and his benevolence upon his slaves. And this is why you see that in Ramadan, people are less likely to engage in sin, more likely to engage in obedience. The shayateen are shackled in it. They are slowed down. 
just like a person that is wearing shackles, is slower, slower to move, slower to respond, less likely to want to move and to get up and get things done. So the shayateen <coughs> are handicapped. They are handicapped. And this is a correction of a misunderstanding that some carry, and that is that the shayateen are entirely jailed and completely unable to move or cause any evil or do any wrong. This is wrong. They are shackled. They are not completely removed from the equation, but they are lower, less effective, if you wish. And this is very important. This is of great significance because scholars of Islam, they mention that the roots of all evil are two. The shaitan and his whispers and the soul in its evil desires. And nafsul ammaratu bisu'i wa shaitan. This is why the Muslim makes the dua that is found in the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam where you seek Allah's refuge from these two. You say, Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min sharri nafsi wa min sharri shaytani wa shirkihi or wa sharakihi. Oh Allah, I seek refuge in you from the evils of myself and from the evils of shaytan and his shirk, his polytheism or sharak. Sharak means traps. The evils of the shaytan and his traps, meaning that he lays for the people. Um, someone is requesting that we send this dua into the chat. Yes, if any of you can find the dua uh, and they can reference the hadith, please put it into the dua. Otherwise, we will do so at the end of our talk. Um, then the Prophet وسلم, he said, Bihi layla. In it, yani in this month, is a, is a night better than a thousand nights. Man hurima khayraha qad hurim or qad hurim. Whoever is denied the good of it, then indeed they have been barred, they have been denied. This is a reference to the famous night known as night, the night of, of power, the night of decree, Laylatul Qadr. In fact, Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala has dedicated an entire surah of the Quran, entire chapter of his book to this night. Along with the fact that it's also been mentioned elsewhere in the Quran. And in that surah, Allah Azza wa Jal said, Laylatul Qadri khayrun min alfi shah. The night of decree is better than a thousand months. A thousand months is more than seven, uh, 87 years. More than 87 years. So basically, the deeds you do in Laylatul Qadr are counted with Allah as deeds you have performed for 87 plus years. Let me put that in a different way. If you were told that an investment you are putting money into is going to yield the returns and the profits of 87 years or slightly more in the coming month. How would you feel about that investment that you are engaged in? The answer automatically is, I would feel that this is definitely the time to remain fully invested in that um, engagement and this is not the time to withdraw or refrain or slow down if anything this is now the time to make my profits to make my gains 
And this is why, if you understand this, this is why the Prophet ﷺ said, whoever is denied the good of it is indeed barred, or he is denied. Yani Allah denied him. No one would miss out on such a benefit except for someone that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has turned away. Someone who Allah has turned away. Now, to, to take matters into our hands, so to speak, what exactly would we want to do to prepare for Laylatul Qadr? Number one, a dua. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make you from the successful in Laylatul Qadr. Because it is, is in his hands. It is he who grants and it is he who denies. Number two is to understand exactly what acts of worship could be your focus on Laylatul Qadr. And those are the night prayers and the dua primarily. And then to that, everything else. Everything else after that is included. But primarily the night prayers and Dua. How do we know this? We know this because the Prophet ﷺ in his sunnah would put extra effort in the night prayers when the last 10 nights of Ramadan came. And the closer he felt that he was to determining Laylatul Qadr, the more he exerted himself in the night prayers. It is mentioned in some of the hadith that the Prophet ﷺ prayed so long that they almost feared missing the opportunity to take a sahur, pre-dawn meal. Because he was feeling that it was so close, so certain that this would be the light of Qadr. The other thing, which is a dua, is also taken from the sunnah. Aisha radiallahu anha is reported to have asked the Messenger وسلم, she said, if I think that it is Laylatul Qadr. If I get the feeling that it is Laylatul Qadr, what should I say? She, he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he taught her, Hey Allahumma inna ka'afoon, ibu al-afwa, ka'afu anni. So he taught, taught her a dua. He, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, taught her a dua. So we understand from this that Laylatul Qadr is a season for dua, it is an opportune time. For raising those words that you've been wanting to address to Allah, those requests that you've been holding in your chest. In fact, it is mentioned that some of our pious predecessors used to prepare for the dua of Ramadan, meaning before Ramadan, they would make lists, things that they need from Allah, things that they want to ask of Him, Azza wa Jal, knowing that dua and Ramadan have a deep connection with one another, especially. In the greatest night of Ramadan, the greatest night of the entire year, I should add, and that is Laylatul Al-Qadr. The hadith that we just narrated is narrated by Imam Ahmed, Sheikh Al-Albani, rahimahullah ta'ala, marked it as authentic. Another hadith showing the same concept is the narration of Anas ibn Malik, radiallahu anhu, the messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said, Haza Ramadan This is Ramadan, it has come. Again, this is the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, giving the glad tidings for receiving Ramadan. So this shows the same concept that we've seen in the hadith of Abu Huraira. And that is, part of receiving Ramadan is give the glad tidings to share the good news that Ramadan has come. And then mention why it is good news. It is good news because of all these different virtues and benefits and blessings and gifts that we receive with the coming of Ramadan. He said, هذا رمضان قد جاء يفتح فيه أبواب الجنة the gates of the Jannah are opened in it. And the gates of the Hellfire are closed in it. And the devils are chained in it. These are uh, the same concepts that we have discussed in the previous hadith. Now, before we go any further, there's one more concept that we would perhaps benefit from greatly. If we were to discuss it and comprehend it and understand it, and that is the concept of doing business with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You see, Allah Azza wa has made no secret of the fact that when we are dealing with Him, we are engaging in business. 
In fact, he Azza wa Jal addressed all the believers. He said, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amin, O you who have believed. This is an address to you and to me and to every believer that has ever accepted Islam from the time of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and until the Day of Judgment. So what is Allah addressing all of us with? Ya ayyuhal ladheena amin, al adullukum ala tijar. Or I not direct you to a tijara, to a business. What is being intended here is a lucrative business, any a winning engagement, something that if you invest in, you will come out with profits and gains. What kind of business, O oh our Lord? He said, Tijara, Injikum min azabin alim. A business that will save you from a severe torment. This is the kind of trade, the kind of business that if you engage in, the first result is that Allah grants you safety from the hellfire. Ramadan, in the eyes of the keen businessman, in the eyes of the keen businesswoman, is a season. This is the season of our business. You know, many businesses are seasonal in nature. To give you examples that perhaps are easy for all of us to understand, the hospitality business is seasonal in nature. If you have a property in a beach city in the summertime where people come to the beach, you find that your business is doing better than usual. Why? Because it is the season for greater traffic and, and, and more customers to be passing through the area. Likewise, in Mecca, shops have more business in the time of Ramadan, in the time of Al-Hajj, because people come from the Umrah in Ramadan, people also come for the Hajj in uh, the end of the, the Qadah and also in Dhul Hijjah. So these are seasons for the businessmen, the shop owners in Mecca, because there's more traffic, more customers, more money flowing into their area. So you, Oh, you who are engaging in business with Allah. You as well should be aware of the seasons where you rake in your profits. You see, in the world of money and finance, if you miss out on the seasons, you've pretty much missed out, you've pretty much missed out on your entire year because some of these businesses that are seasonal in, seasonal in nature, they make so much profit during this season that it more than covers their expenses for the entire year. And since we are in the business of saving ourselves from a severe punishment, then we have to take this into understanding. How does Ramadan tie in with this concept? Ramadan, man samahu imanan wa ihtisaban, ghufira lahu ma taqaddama min dhambi. Ramadan, whoever fasts it, out of faith, imanan, out of dealing with Allah, ihtisaban, and you're counting on a specific reward. There's a specific exchange and an agreement between you and Allah. You fast, Allah forgives you. And all his sins past have been forgiven. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Consider this tremendous reward, tremendous engagement. You've made profits from fasting this one month that more than cover your whole year. They cover your whole life. All his sins passed. There's another narration in which the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, Ramadan kafara li ma baynahuma. Fasting Ramadan, meaning to fasting the next Ramadan is a repudiation, a removal, an erasure of whatever has occurred between them. So any sins from Last Ramadan that occurred 
throughout the month until this Ramadan. If you fast this Ramadan, all those sins that are in between, they're in the middle, are expunged. They are forgiven. You kafiru Allah. Allah Azza wa removes them by His mercy and by His grace. We ask Allah Azza wa to allow us to reach Ramadan and to make us from the successful in it. When you understand this concept that Ramadan is, is, is the season for your business, then you also become worried, just like the people of business become worried. That this season is the time where I'm going to hunker down. This is the time that I'm going to really just put my head down and focus and get everything that I need out of the squeezing. I'm going to squeeze it to the last drop and get everything that I uh, possibly can out of it before the season is over. This is why you see the people who are actually engaged in these seasonal businesses, sometimes they will skip out on sleep. Sometimes they will skip out on meals. Normally, during the rest of the year, they'll come home for lunch and maybe take a midday nap and do this and do that and so on and so forth. But when it comes time for the season, sometimes they'll sleep in the shop. They'll eat in the shop and they'll skip a certain meal. They deem it unnecessary because, you know, business is too good right now and I cannot let this go. The competition between the businessmen becomes another factor that drives them into more and more fervor in the pursuit of these gains and profits, such as Ramadan. We take cue from one another. We see each other in the masajid. We see the brothers and the sisters tending to taraweeh in Ramadan. We see the sisters competing with one another and who is going to feed the largest number of fasting people, help them break their fast so I can get their reward. So this becomes a further driver of competition, driver of multiplying your gains and your profits from this business, the business of Ramadan. Barakallah Jalla wa ala alladhi shara'ahu wa yassarahu li ibadih ودعاهم فيه إلى الخير. We ask Allah to make us all from the gainers in this tremendous month, the month of Ramadan. The last concept I want to mention <coughs> is that which is found in a number of ahadith. Let us start with what is narrated in Tabarani's Mu'jam on the authority of Jabir ibn Samra radiallahu anhu Shaykh al-Albani rahimahullah he marks this as authentic he said sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Itani Jibreel alayhi salam Jibreel May the greetings of peace be upon him came to me. Aqala ya Muhammad. And he said, O oh Muhammad, Man Adraka Ahada Wali Dehi Shamata Fadahal and Nar Fabadahullah. Whoever lives long enough to see, to witness, to be in the company of one of his parents, and then he dies after having lived that long. And then he enters the hellfire. Then may Allah cast him away. May Allah distance him, meaning from all good. This is Jibreel telling the Prophet ﷺ how he feels about these individuals. Who are they? People who have lived long enough to see their parents, see one of their parents, live long enough where they have reached the age of understanding, the age of comprehension. And when they reach that age, one of their parents was still alive and still available and in their company. And then this person, after having reached that age, died and entered the hellfire. Jibreel, what does he feel about these people? He's angry with them. Not only so, he makes dua against them. He says, Abadahullah. May Allah cast him away. May Allah distance him, meaning from everything good. 
Not only so, but then Jibreel goes on to say, Qul Ameen is instructing Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to say Ameen. Ameen means, Oh Allah, answer this dua. Qul Ameen. Faqultu Ameen. So I said Ameen. Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said Ameen. قال يا محمد then he said oh محمد من أدرك شهر رمضان فمات فلم يغفر له فأدخل النار أبعده الله قل آمين فقلت آمين ومحمد whoever arrives at Ramadan lives long enough to see Ramadan and then he dies without having been forgiven and then enters the hellfire then may Allah cast him away May Allah distance him, meaning from everything good. Hey, Ami. So I said, Ami, to the end of the hadith. <clears throat> this hadith shows Jibreel, the greatest of the angels, making dua against these two types of people. Well, it's three types of people, but we didn't read the rest of the hadith. Not only so, but instructing the Messenger وسلم, to say Ameen to his dua. And so the Messenger وسلم, responded immediately and said Ameen. So this is a dua made by the greatest of the angels. And Ameen was stated by the greatest of the messengers. Do you think this dua is going to be answered? I believe so. Emphatically. There is no doubt that this dua is going to be answered. The question here becomes, how come? This angel that comes down with good comes down with revelation. Why is he making dua against these people? This messenger, whom Allah Azza wa Jal described as bil mu'minina ra'ufun rahim, merciful and compassionate towards the believers. In fact, ma arsalnaka illa rahmatan lil alameen. Allah said about him, we have not sent you except as a mercy to all creation. He's making dua. He's, he's making ta'meen. Asking Allah to answer this dua. How come? If anyone has an answer, we could perhaps take answers from uh, the brothers and the sisters in chat, or if you want to raise your hand, we can hear the answer audibly. Maybe we repeat the question for those of us who um, <clears throat> didn't catch it. In this hadith that is narrated by Jabir ibn Samura, radiallahu anhu, Messenger Sallallahu mentioned what Jibreel said about the people who live long, long enough to see Ramadan and then still enter, enter the hellfire, still are unforgiven. And how Jibreel asked Allah Azza to cast them away and further requested from Muhammad Sallallahu to say Ameen to his dua. So the Prophet then joined in in that dua and said Ameen. My question is why? Why is this merciful Prophet and this great angel making dua against these people, those people who have reached Ramadan and exited Ramadan unforgiven and ended up in the hellfire anyways? Why are these people the subject of this angry dua? I see some answers here.
ما شاء الله ما شاء الله ما شاء الله جزاكم الله خير for all those who participated with answers جزاكم الله خير طيب for those of you who um, <coughs> are waiting for the answer this is correct because Ramadan is such a tremendous opportunity for forgiveness there are so many avenues by which to be forgiven in Ramadan that only the forsaken only the wretched will exit from this month without having been forgiven this hadith functions to illustrate two points point number one is that it is so easy to be forgiven in Ramadan a person has to be unusually wretched they have to be that rare exception from the most corrupt of people to exit Ramadan without having been forgiven number two a further incentive for those who are immersed in sin, who are drowning in wretchedness, to exit that state and come back to the obedience of Allah and His worship. For not only are they missing out on the opportunities of Ramadan, but further they are subjecting themselves to the wrath of Allah as clearly indicated by the dua of Rasulullah against them. Messenger وسلم, who loves his ummah, who begs Allah, he says, Ummati, Ummati, my ummah, my ummah, and he saves them, oh Allah, is now turning against these people and asking Allah to cast them away, to forsake them. And this is not something that the Prophet would do unless these people have indeed committed something so heinous as to uh, make them the exception and uh, make them th- from those that the Prophet wants nothing to do with. Now, um, we can take uh, a look at some of the narrations that clearly show how Ramadan is such an easy opportunity. Take, for example, that which is narrated by Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu, found in Bukhari and Muslim. The Messenger sallam, said, Man sama Ramadan iman and ihtisab and ufira lahu ma taqaddama min dhambih. Whoever fasts Ramadan out of faith and out of ihtisab, counting the reward with Allah, all his sins past will be forgiven. So not only the sins of the year or the sins of the month or you know this type of sin or that type of sin, but the sins pass. In other words, he comes to Allah with a clean slate. Is that the only way to enter Jannah? To come to Allah with a clean slate? Obviously not. But that's a humongous amount of forgiveness. Many slaves will come to Allah with some sins, but Allah will forgive them because they have good deeds. Many slaves will come to Allah with a lot of sins. But they will come to Allah with a lot of good deeds, so Allah will forgive them. But this is an indication that when you fast Ramadan properly, in this fashion, you come to Allah with a clean slate. All his sins past are forgiven. This is tremendous forgiveness. The hadith goes on. And whoever stands in the night prayers in Laylatul Qadr, out of Iman, faith, Wahtisab and counting his reward with Allah, all his sins past will be forgiven. This is narrated in Bukhari and Muslim. In another narration, the Prophet ﷺ said, Man Ramadan iman and min Whoever attends the night prayers or prays the night prayers in Ramadan, meaning the whole month, iman and muhtisab and out of faith and counting his reward with Allah wa ta'ala, min all his sins past will be forgiven. The humongous amount of forgiveness. This tremendous forgiveness. In one of the ahadith, the Messenger وسلم, said, And Allah has <coughs> slaves that He grants them al-itq, amnesty, freedom, salvation from the fire. And that is every single night. Narrated by Abu Hurairah, عنه, found in Sunan al Imam al Tirmidhi and Sunan ibn Majah, Shaykh al Albani, ranked it authentic. The previous hadith about standing in the night prayers for the entirety of Ramadan, Iman, and Wahtisab, and Qufir Allahumma Taqaddama min Zambihi is found in Bukhari Muslim. That we are trying to make here is that the opportunity to be forgiven in Ramadan is such an easy opportunity to take advantage of. The avenues by which you can be forgiven are so many in Ramadan, whether it's from the fasting, or from the night prayers, or from just catching that one night, Laylatul Qadr, or from 
uh, feeding the hungry or feeding those who are fasting or from reading an abundance of Quran or, or, or. There are so many avenues that truly only the wretched will miss out on all of these opportunities. The devils are chained. The, the sins and the desires that surround them are made more difficult. The good deeds are easier to accomplish. The Muslimin are plentiful. They're in the masajid competing with one another, encouraging one another, increase, increasing the zeal in the hearts of one another. And yet this person continues on the path of destruction, running away from Allah Taala instead of running back to Allah. They are indeed wretched and they deserve the dua of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam against them. We ask Allah not to make any of us from those people. And inshaAllah Ta'ala, we will suffice with this much. We ask Allah Jalla wa ala to benefit us with that which we have said and heard. And that Allah make us from those who heed the words of their Lord and the wisdom found in them. And those who follow in the footsteps of his messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, with sincerity, seeking the face of Allah. And bi'idhnillahi ta'ala, we will continue to um, gather together for the next few Sundays, bi'idhnillahi ta'ala, having these kinds of talks surrounding Ramadan and reading uh, together some of the texts of the Quran and the Sunnah pertaining to it. We ask Allah Azza wa Jal to accept all of this from us. Jazakumullah jami'an khayran. Um, we mentioned that we were going to post the hadith. Aisha, may Allah be pleased with the report. I asked the Messenger of Allah if I realize Laylatul Qadr, what should I supplicate in it? Jameel. There was another hadith that we were talking about. I also see something interesting here. Someone did the math and came up with a thousand months divided by 12 equals 83.3 years. Jameel. This is a correction, yeah. 83 years, not 87. So the dua we were talking about that we wanted to share with the brothers and sisters is Allahumma ni'udhu bika mishari nafsi wa mishari shaytani wa shirki. Let's see if we can find it. Also, brothers and sisters, for those that follow Saudi Arabia for the Ramadan and moon sighting, it has been cited and there has been a, a, an official announcement that tomorrow will be the first fast of Ramadan, inshallah ta'ala. So we, we give you the congratulations and the blessings of Ramadan, that may Allah bless it for you all. Okay, I posted the, uh, the dua, Jazakumullah khayran. I don't have the translation handy, but this is it in Arabic. Inshallah, we will suffice with this much. Jazakumullah jami'an khayran. Subhanakallahumma bihamdi. Ashhadu an la ilaha illa anta. Astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk.